uh, very quickly, I'm going to give a talk which is try, going to try giving a sort of conceptual framework to understand what I think have been some of the main problems of open access in the last 20 years and, uh, and how we might be able to overcome that and how it relates, of course, to the issue of repositories. So I want to start very far back saying that, of course, we're all used to living in some sort of sociological context, if you want to conceptualize society. And, uh, and this is absolutely true in my own uh, uh, way of looking at things until people began to at least draw images, or perhaps even when they started inventing spoken language. Uh, but I'll, I'll stop with the images. Why? Because as soon as images appear, uh, where can you draw the images? Is it free for all to draw there? And uh, how, do you know, how do you do images? How do you learn the techniques to rep re represent, for example, these images from the Lascaux cave in France, which date from 18,000 years ago? And the, the basic sociology, I think, is well portrayed by this photo, two people talking to each other. The third person has even elected to turn its back to the conversation. Uh, you have there the people choose to either interact or not, and that's it. It's a single layer sociology, but many other things happen. For example, there is a document-to-document -document sociology which changes with the means of expressing uh, our thoughts, our ideas in a concrete material manner. Here we see shells putting books together in a certain way, which is obviously going to affect the way you access those books. I made a couple joking references. Here is a quotation of a Goethe poem um, about Natur und Kunst, uh, which is uh, actually in Holland, so that creates a whole series of interrogations about using quotations in a language in a different country and so on. And the last one is an artistic joke, actually, of a URL engraved in stone. So you may do your own uh, meditation about this particular uh, exercise. There is also the way we relate to documents, and I just had fun finding very quickly how, for example, in schools we are schooled to relate to writing in a certain way, reading in a certain way, and I just added for uh, more diverse sources uh, what you can see with a early TTY type, type, uh, type something, and that gives the text and or an e-book in this case. So, the triple sociology, as I'm going to call it throughout this, this uh, presentation, is obviously related to technological matters. Between human beings, I can give you a whole list of them. Between human and documents, same thing. And between documents, you have again a, a series of technical tools. Yet, I would argue very strongly, I don't think you can read it, but the triple sociology is not about technology. And that's going to be one of the main points of my talk today. I've noticed, and it was just said again very, very recently, um, how much, allow me to say it this way, how much so many of you are mesmerized by the technology. Perhaps because it's in, unfamiliar, because it's a bit difficult, because you're struggling with it, because you want to master it. It ends up being the, the, the end product. It's not. The end product of this whole thing is to help researchers work better together to do better research. This is the, the means of that. And it's the, the, the center of the target that we must keep in front of us. So how does it, all this work, this triple sociology, to, when we apply it to scholarly communication? Well, how do researchers interact with each other? And basically, there are two basic modes, collaboration or competition. How do researchers, scholars interact with documents? And that's the whole workflow area which is being discussed more and more in, uh, in all kinds of uh, fora that have to do with scientific communication. And how do scientific documents relate to each other? Well, then we have this issue of libraries, shelves, but also links, citations, comments, etc. And in the digital world, and that's why I use this sort of very abstract and remote notion of a triple sociology. You can start imagining and, and, and studying how the triple socio sociology evolves in new ways. And one of the ways in which it, it appears, 
is in the um, emergence of many new words, or words which remain the same but take on subtly, very subtly, a new meaning. So the very new words that come along are often quite fuzzy, and they refer to entities which are even harder to identify. And I've given some which may shock you. Repositories, what is it? A portal, what is it? A mega journal, do you really know what it is? A platform? I've had so long, so many long discussions with Kathleen that I can absolutely guarantee with her as a witness that the word platform is a fuzzy word. Um, <laughs> journals, oh, that looks so obvious. Oh yeah? Articles, you're so sure that you know what an article really is and how it has changed in the recent past in the recent, in the, or in the more distant past. Good luck. I'm going to throw in one which is my own invention because there you're going to know how fuzzy it can be. A crystal of knowledge. I'll let you, in, I'll let you explore that. Blogs, etc. I mean, I'm just having fun. All these words are there. We use them. And then, of course, to make things even better, we use stock phrases that mean even less, you know, like sustainability. What's that? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, stakeholder, mm, I don't know what that is either, and so on. But apparently people like to speak without saying anything, and I'm a good proof of it by being here right now. Uh, so let's ask really, what is an article, a journal, a portal, a platform? And where do repositories fit into this? So I'm, the rest of my presentation is going to try approaching this a little bit. The words in that digital context also reveal changes in uh, humans in our triple sociology. For example, the term of author, which until about 1980 appeared like something ab absolutely familiar, solid, well-known, and so on, suddenly began to be submitted to critical analysis and a, 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 a philosopher like Michel Foucault, for example, uh, shook the earth by showing us that an author doesn't exist, only author functions exist, and then he proceeds to show how they appeared, these author functions, and you discover that a good many of them were actually designed not to create a kind of a, a prestige stage for an individual, but rather were related to notions of legal liability, uh, right of, uh, I mean, necessity to keep within an orthodoxy, and so on and so forth. And you have all these notions beginning to multiply uh, around the human actors that are involved in the scholarly communication, which are worth looking at. Publishers are going to and are revealing also their publishing functions and so do readers and reviewers and users, and we find more and more discussions about how authors and readers exchange roles and, and so on and so forth in to, to come to, a to a, an absolutely unescapable conclusion, which is that the whole series of actors we were used to in the print world is in total flux. And what is even more interesting is that these functions, which used to be distributed in fairly, fairly clear and fairly, uh, again, familiar uh, institutions, can now begin to be distributed in new ways. And for example, and we'll come back to that point, you may have seen for your, in the scholarly kitchen a, a, a blog by Kent Anderson who was complaining that the founders were straying out of their lane because they were getting involved in publishing. Well, that's part of this general process. He doesn't like it, that's his problem, but it, it's simply there to show how all these roles, functions, institutions are being remixed right now. And this is, I think, a very important sort of background to keep in mind to analyze the whole situation. Let's take the example of the publisher. Now, since Oldenburg, at least, we know that publishing actually uh, harbors four, four basic principles. A principle of registration, for example, author and title, a certification of what has been published, this is the peer review, the preservation, which is actually not part of the publisher, but really the role of 
the, uh, the uh, library unless you accept to put next to the libraries the warehouses of a printing press. But I'm not sure that's a very noble uh, building to put next to a library. And finally, you have dissemination. You have the book and journal trade. So even when you look at that, the traditional print pub publisher with his four basic uh, principles, even there, one of them doesn't even belong to the publisher. It's not even in the hands of the publisher. And more recently, we've added to all this publishing uh, process uh, a role of evaluation, which has become, as you know, equated with the impact factor. So, conclusion, the publisher has been viewed for very long as a monolith, and I would argue that it's only a print construct. So we are going into the digital destruct of the publisher, which is an interesting perspective, it seems to me, at least for if you put into the target of my arrow right here some well-known names. Okay, these uh, functions can be spread across, as I've said, various actors. The registration, for example, you are in a research center or a university or whatever institution that does research, where can you register your work most efficiently on the shortest time basis and most securely? Well, in the institution itself. You could imagine that universities are going to say, we register the submissions to be done of our uh, own personnel, or our own researchers, in our own institution, and our repository can do that. It can do that. We can timestamp and, and name a submission to be done. Nothing, nothing very difficult about that. It's a question of how to manage this thing. That's a practical question to solve. Theoretically, it's extremely simple to answer. And practically, it's not very difficult. Certification, as is shown in some of the uh, uh, cutting edge experiments going on right now, like F1000 research, can be completely carried out outside of journals. So don't imagine that certification can only place if you have a journal. Uh, the first journal, as you all know, was created in 1665. I think knowledge was being certified in other ways well before 1665. The, the notion of proof, the notion of truth, the notion of uh, clinging to reality did not wait for the Royal Society to express itself. You know, that seems to me very, very basic and simple. And, the, and another point too, which is certification right now is done in a sort of secret way behind the door. I don't want to be known. I, I want to talk to the, the editor and say the author is an ass, uh, but just to the editor. I would never say that to the author, which between you and me is not a very, not a very nice way to behave to people if you say bad things to them behind their back. Uh, so uh, now we have certification can, which can take place in the open. And you know what the paradox has been of that? If you talk to Vitek Traksh of F1000 Research about that, or if you watch some of his videos, he'll tell you that they never had, never had any trouble getting peer reviewers because the peer reviewers' contribution to an article becomes part of the scientific record and it becomes citable and it can be added to a CV so in effect, when you do your, your, uh, your certification job as a researcher, you're not doing it because you only think you are fulfilling a duty to the community. You're actually participating in the process and the dynamics of the great conversation that scientific knowledge production should always and has always been actually in its heart. So I think these are and other, other points which show how you can spread things around various actors. Articles can change again. Now in this slide I did put the reference to the, uh, what do you call this, to the, do you hear me well by the way, um, uh, to, to the little article where this notion appeared, but what Crystal of Knowledge is really responding to the necessity that researchers have to be able to discuss I would say serenely, around a relatively stabilized version of a, of a claim, okay? You have an author and they, 
and or the, several authors who establish a claim about something, you've got to have, I mean, you, you cannot do that with Trump. It changes all the time. And you need to stabilize Trump periodically. And to stabilize Trump periodically, well, you can print him, then he won't budge. Uh, but in the digital era, it's more difficult, so you try and find processes and protocols that allow you to say the text you're reading right now is a text that has been stabilized and has been designed for further conversation, for in fact the peer review, which is also going to be part of the scientific record and which is going to create the dynamics of knowledge production in the digital context. Lib and of course, if you do that, you are moving towards a, word, a world where you're not producing articles and certainly not uh, versions of record, which really loses any sense at all. What you want is a conversation of record with versions coming through that uh, discussion. And at the end of it, you have, a, you have understood how this thing came to be where it is how it went there, maybe there are necessities to bifurcate, bifurcate this uh, discussion at some point through another process, whatever, but you are following a dynamics and not just freezing a conversation. So the crystal of knowledge was really the, this kind of a metaphor because a crystal is hard, but it can grow. So it has this uh, dual, dual uh, notion. Libraries, uh, can certainly preserve digital files better than publishers. We've already talked about the preservation issue. Just take the, the, the agreements between Elsevier and the Royal Library in Holland. Uh, El, even Elsevier has to admit that if they went belly up at some point, what happens to their, their store? And what would happen to the scientific archive now that the libraries, as, was, as Greg reminded us, no longer own the, the the documents, they just license access to them, which is a very bad choice, by the way. Um, dissemination is gone. It's internet access. If you look at the prospectus of this wonderful IPO uh, attempt by Springer to go into the stock exchange, yay, Springer. Um, the, uh, the, you know that they, one of the things they say is that, well, the good thing about uh, open access publishing is that we don't have to maintain a marketing team. Incidentally, I've always wondered in my head why you need to market Einstein. You know, I mean, the whole notion of marketing knowledge is to me, uh, I don't understand. I just don't understand. It's a, it's, a, it's a good example of the confusion of our minds in a world in which knowledge production and circulation looks more and more like a commercial process. And finally, with this, uh, these changes, we have a chance to go back to a, a form of evaluation which can be based on content, actual content, real Einstein if you want, and not the journals where Einstein published. Who cares? I mean, between you and me, who really cares where Einstein published? What's important are some of the interesting equations he derived from his uh, thinking. You know, do you know where E equals MC square really appeared first in which journal? And do you think that's important to remember? I don't, in case it wasn't clear yet. Uh, <laughs> So in the digital world, one very important element is actually a very obvious result. It, anybody who has watched the, um, the software world, and in particular the open source or free software, the two cousin worlds, knows that publishing doesn't exist anymore. It's just releasing. And you release versions, and you maintain tracks of, of versions. And your repositories will have to take care of that sooner or later. In fact, one of the good ways to really, I would say, uh, dilute some of the power of the existing publishers in their monolithic um, appearance right now would be to create a good version system just to show that their versions of record is just one version among several. Okay. But let's go now to this issue that has been discussed quite a bit and rightfully in this conference about reputation, visibility, prestige, authority. And I present that as a researcher with a Janus face, an individual. He's both an information seeker and user, 
on the one hand, and also a status seeker. And the problem with open access in general, particularly on the side of repositories, has been very weak about researcher status. I don't know if any repository could claim in any way to have really enhanced the status of a researcher, all this despite some little noise which never convinced everybody all the time about the, fam the famous OA advantage. But I can tell you, my colleagues in my university, when I would say you are going to be cited more if you're in the repository, would answer to me, that's not what I care. I want to be published by this journal for my CV. The rest, I don't care. If no one reads me, who cares? I want to be in that journal. Many articles in Nature are never cited. So, the lack of good answers to status uh, concerns, it seems to me, is uh, one major factor to explain or account for the slow uptake of op open access, in particularly in the repositories. Publishers, on the other hand, as you know, have established a very firm, really firm monopoly on how to establish the status and the prestige of all of us. You publish, I had a colleague, uh, by Vincent Larivière, who has been named, and rightfully so, here, who's done some fantastic work on the citations and, and, and the structure of scientific publishing. Vincent was telling me one day with a big bright smile, hey, when you publish in Nature, your telephone gets hot, you know? So, and he was, he was tickled pink. That was clear. Uh, I was happy for him. I mean, he's a fine guy and he does good work and I'm glad he was in nature. But you see how the thing works for people. Ah, you know. <laughs> so, let's go back to that triple sociology. What's important in the triple sociology has been the human-human interaction. And that in any study of... Uh, based by this triple sociology framework, you have to put the human-human interaction at the center, of course. Now, the relationship between researchers nowadays is no longer really often a relationship of good collaboration and sometimes competition. It's as if we had all internalized the famous uh, uh, the famous battle between Pauling and Cricks, and we think that every little piece of work we do, which interests really very few people, uh, uh, is going to be the, you know, the, the, the battlefield, a, a gigantic battlefield that expects and awaits for its hammer, you know? And I don't think that is exactly the best way to manage research. We have put as a tool, as a tool, of management of researchers, a principle, and uniquely a principle of competition. Now, don't uh, take my words for what I'm not saying. I'm not saying there is no competition between scientists or researchers. There is. But it has to be, and it is only in certain moments, in certain circumstances, and between certain kinds of individuals. A lot of the work we do as researchers is really without any concern or much concern about other, other researchers, especially if you are in extremely esoteric fields which have attracted a relatively small number of colleagues. And competition, that's its problem. It shapes the technology, not the reverse. So I say if you want to understand the kind of competition that goes on, learn to decipher the technology of our, schol of our schol scholarly communication system. It's, uh, it's a very good and instructive exercise to do. At the same time, the impact factor has become the unique and very bad currency of this competition. So, the impact factor, we all know it, structures competition, and it does it all the way from the individual to the countries. And that's what its power, that's where its power stands too. Because if you as an individual refuse to play too much that kind of game, your institution is not going to be happy with you, and that's not terribly good for your career. And if somehow too many of us 
are beginning to do that in the institution, that's not very good for the institution because the government above is not going to be very happy in its funding of, the, uh, of these uh, people and these institutions. And then it goes into a ranking of countries into saying, oh, this is the best country for research. This is not so good. This leads to very amusing and interesting results. Like one of the power countries in vaccine development is a country that would never appear in those rankings, at least not very high. It's Cuba. And uh, Cuba is a very important and very good and very original uh, industry, uh, vac vaccine industry. But it doesn't appear in these kinds of rankings at all. So let's go now to the last part of the, of the talk. I'm going to go back to the repositories. And I couldn't resist uh, this image, of course. You know, it's Dutch. So I think our Canadian representative was uh, with a good Dutch name. We all know Dutch is not a language. It's a throat disease. Uh, and the, uh, uh, and uh, as you know, Holland just loves cows. Well, you know, when you're mesmerized by your technology and you're, you're saying, oh, I'm using this space and not ePrint and so on and so forth, uh, I think the notion of silo becomes very, very obvious. And you, you wonder how long, how long uh, it's going to last and what good it does to the whole system. Are there more than silos on dear repositories? And the response by, by especially techies is going to say, oh, no, no, we have OAIPMH, we have OAIPMH, we have, or even better now, I forget what it was, but it's, uh, it's even better. Okay, let's take OAIPMH and let's take one of the tools that was developed by WorldCat not originally, but picked up by, not World Cup, by OCLC, uh, called Oysters. So I did a little search. I did a little search on, in an English language, English language. I didn't take Chinese or I didn't take uh, French, you know, esoteric language as they are. Uh, no, I took English and I, I asked for this article, which was, is a good article, by the way, so you, I recommend you read it if you can find it. If you use Oyster, I don't think you're going to find much of it because it, it, uh, it, uh, it gives that. No result match for your etc. You don't do it. So this is an article in Cielo. Oyster is not capable of, using, of finding an article in the Cielo uh, center, the Cielo platform. And Cielo is using OAI PMH. So what's going on here? So, Let's go to Google Scholar, there it works. Okay, so you know how to find now the article. So indeed, part of the solution is really working with the good search engines and particularly, I suspect, Google Scholar to try and expose your, your, uh, your content to, to uh, such search engines. And uh, you had a webinar at CORE last fall precisely on this thing. I give the reference here again uh, to it for those of you who might have missed it. But the, uh, all this is only part of the answer. The answer cannot be purely technical. What you have to do is really think about, again, the researcher, and you've heard me moan and whine about that all through the conference. Uh, you have to remember that the researcher, as a st sat status seeker, must be satisfied which means that we have to go beyond the commercialized IF impact factor driven journals. And there we hit a wall because the term journal is really entrenched. I think it's Eloy who was at the same time saying there won't be journals in the future, but underpinning, underscoring the fact that journals are, are really solidly in the system right now. So it, how do we do that? How can we do that? And my, my recommendation is to be tricky and sneaky you keep the word. It's a bit like stakeholders and uh, sustainability, you know, all that stuff that doesn't mean anything. And, um, and uh, you just think about journals, but you mean something entirely different. And among yourselves, you make sure that you know those terms precisely. Okay? What would be the best model for a scholarly journal? And there is a long slide. By the way, the, the whole thing is in the hands of CORE, and it's all uh, CC BY, so you can uh, use it as much as you want. I've been pretty uh, 
pretty good about checking the pictures that I, they were all public domain or in CC by CC something. Um, but uh, here you have a whole series of, of reasons uh, why we can, uh, of not reasons of, of criteria, that would allow us to see what a good journal might be. And amusingly, the, perhaps the best way is not to invent the wheel again, it's simply to look at the traditional society-led journal. I mean society-led journal. I don't mean Elsevier or Springer-led journal, okay? So, it's the voice, and, they, and I think that's my main point in all these points. That's why it's in number one, of course. It's the voice of a scholarly community. I'm going to come back to the notion of community later. It seeks to reach also other communities. It, it needs financial support, but the financial support is designed in such a way that it cannot interfere with the scientific process per se. The present system does. And if you don't believe me, ask me the question. And then I'll go around and Ray for half an hour. It's a threat. Uh, it, it, it puts the journal very close to the workflow of the researchers. The research communities really control those journals. And what's more important, those journals are not, evolved, are not uh, ranked through some sort of crazy metric, but rather through those journals, their interactions with other journals in other societies, other communities, reputations gradually build. People pretty well know, pretty well know what are the good journals and where to, where to find the good information. There was a, 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 a paper done recently which showed that people's perception of significant research did not correlate at all with citations. So think about that. People's perception of significance does not correlate with citations. So what, does cit what do citations correlate with? Citing my mother-in-law, maybe? I don't know. So we find uh, the whole is problem of uh, evaluation now realigned <laughs> Uh, with reputation, and both competition and cooperation now find their place side by side in that kind of vehicle. Okay, so I'm going to give you a very, very challenging and probably shocking objective. Repositories need to recreate journals in big quotation marks. It's a bit funny when you say it that way, because if you think of the history of open access and the long disputes and discussions of, between green and gold, what I'm saying is there is that the green road should, should actually support the gold road. Well, I must say in 2004, I did write uh, an article about mixing and matching where I, I was saying the ultimate solution would actually make the two roads converge. That's what I'm saying in different terms here with a, a, a deeper analysis. So how do we do that? Well, it starts with networking. Well, I have, if, my God, if I haven't heard the word networking in the last three days, I, you know, I've never heard it. Uh, but uh, networking is a bit like key, you know, stakeholders and sustainability and all that crap. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult to, to, to grab it and have clear principles about it, clear ideas about it. So, I'm going to insist that, yeah, network, but network according to some principles, which? Well, we touched about that about two days ago. I said, I said to myself, I think we should think of an institutional depository as a town, a town peopled with documents. Now, the image of town, I think, is interesting. Why? Because, first of all, a town uh, is... Uh, in the business of living, thriving, growing, and it needs to link to other towns. And also it requires a hinterland. Okay? So where does that lead us? Well, real towns relate to each other according essentially to two principles, physical proximity and economic complementarity. So our repository, or depository, 
per, can it also relate to other repositories. I, I should have written repository, not depository, but I, I always mix up those two things. And, um, and I would say that the disciplinary axis would be something similar to proximity in the physical world, and the problem-solving uh, axis would open up the search for complementarity. So do two ways of relating to other repositories. And it's at that point that when these repositories begin to seek those two elements of proximity in repositories and, uh, and complementarity with other repositories that you can start thinking about a network of repositories beginning to look like a platform. And it begins to fulfill roles in that triple sociology. It brings the documents in a certain way, it makes people relate to them in a certain way, and it creates a system of visibility, evaluation, and access, which is also uh, particular to that, that form of principled networking. Platforms themselves are not ends in themselves. Other platforms will exist elsewhere, or even in the same territory, but according to other principles. And again, you can have principles of uh, linkings between the, um, these platforms. And in this, you rediscover the fractal nature of what scientific knowledge production is all about. But we had already discovered that with this kind of universal role that impact factors were playing from the individual to the, to the whole planet. So in effect, we are restating the fractal nature of knowledge production in entirely different terms, and I think far better terms. So, the intellectual proximity of repositories is going to start looking very much like what you call thematic repositories or, or disciplinary base things, and they, in effect, the closest you can, find, you can be to traditional journals, so you can, in fact, when you start thinking about what you call your layering of services and functions above the, the basic storage, you can re reassemble that as a new style journal, but completely under the control now of the research community. And when you go to intellectual complementarity, you are really dealing with what you might call the solving of problems in, in, a, in an interdisciplinary way, and that's what has been known in some circles as the mode two production of knowledge for those of you who've a bit played around with science and technology studies. That I'm referring to the book of 94 by Michael Gibbons and his colleagues. So, this organizing networking in this fashion of course, allows you to now rework what evaluation and impact uh, can be. And instead of having this kind of monotonous, metric-based impact factor um, form of evaluation, you can now divide your evaluation along three axes, three very different axes in which you're going to find things that you already know. The intellectual significance, which somehow the... Uh, the, uh, the impact factor claims to approach, but in such a perverse way that uh, you say to yourself, the devil must have had a lot of fun that day. Uh, there is the issue of relevance. And as you know, the term relevance means nothing. In other words, that mean, means nothing unless it's relevant to X, something very precise. Here, it would be relevance to a specific problem uh, that, that needs solving. And then you have a, a third notion which I found in uh, Juan Pablo Alperin's uh, thesis where he distinguishes between impact and reach. And reach is where you go beyond the traditional audience of scientific or scholarly papers, that is the academic group of, or beyond academic, I mean the group of researchers, to uh, plunge into what I call here very quickly the hinterland, but where actually I mean by this the um, uh, 
students, professors, ministerial aides, and so on, who need information, doctors, patients, and the, the whole crew the, of people that need information in order to live better in their society. Now, the, uh, the competition itself can be limited, circumscribed, organized in terms of its real use for the development of science. When you have a real controversy between scientists, like it's precisely Crick's and, and, and on one hand and, and Pauling on the other hand, competition is fine. That's where people really give their best to show that they're going to find the right solution faster than the other. That's very good for science, but a lot of science doesn't take place that way. And you don't use it as a general mindless principle to manage, to manage everything. I promise I will not hit you again. Uh, uh, the, the also this notion of proximity and complementarity now allows us to go beyond uh, the vague, another vague word, which is growing communities. Uh, communities, yeah, it's so wonderful. You never know what it is. We don't want these communities to be like crowds. So with the notion of proximity, intellectual proximity, and uh, problem solving complementarity, you have ways to create effective, strong, rich um, groups of researchers. Finally, the repositories, it seems to me, have two key strategic forms of positioning themselves. They are able, because they are in the institution itself, to stay close to the workflow of researchers and really, re repositories should pay a lot of attention to all the discussions around workflow and be the first ones doing that well. I think that's a very, very important element uh, for the future of repositories. Read the, the text by Schoenfeld. I think he, he says a lot of interesting stuff about that. And uh, they can contribute to um, universal science. There would be a lot to say about the terms like universal, global, and so on. Universality of science refers to anybody being able to contribute and the results being valid any place on the planet, or even beyond, I hope. Um, but uh, they, they can contribute those repositories to universal science, and yet they can do it without having to neglect, as is the case particularly in many developing nations, or global south countries, as, uh, to use that vocabulary, uh, without having to neglect direct and present concerns locally. Remember that Zika, the virus, was identified in the late 40s. And we're still with it, and we still don't know what to do with it. 